Welcome back to a story to tell from the campus of Dixie State University. Today we're speaking with Jan Broberg. Mm -hmm. Did I pronounce that correctly? You did. Good job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I need to learn how to pronounce things mm -hmm. better. That's all right. Jan, tell me a little bit about yourself, who you are, where you came from, what you're doing, why you're here. Okay. Well, where I came from. Um, I grew up in Pocatello, Idaho, and I have been living in Los Angeles, California, and I've also lived here in the St. George area in Santa Clara, have a home there, and have just recently moved back to the area to take a job as the executive director at the new theater out in the Cayenta community in Ivan's. It's a brand new center for the arts. So I'm a big uh, arts supporter. I've been an actress since I was six, and I've worked all over the country and in film, television, stage, you know, to a con. St. George Musical Theater, many things that you would know from this area as well as a lot of other places. Yeah. So, well, we're glad to have you back. Thank you. And I'm a mother. I have a son. And I have a wonderful uh, extended family that are also kind of migrating to warmer weather. <laughs> here? Are they coming here? Yeah, I have a sister who's now moved here, and my, my mom and dad are still here now uh, out of Idaho. And then I have another sister who lives in Arizona with her family, but a lot of her children are actually going to school here at DSU <laughs> <laughs> and working here. So. Well, the prior mayor, Dan MacArthur, said you either live in St. George, the area, or you're gonna live here. Yeah. <laughs> You're following that tradition. I know, it's just so beautiful. You can't get scenery that's any better than this, and you certainly certainly can't get weather any place where there's not so much traffic you want to lose your mind. <laughs> well, tell me a little bit about your acting career. Okay. Um, I started at age six as Gretel in The Sound of Music in my community theater, which was also part of the university, Idaho State University, and I never have stopped since. I have been acting in stage plays, musicals, film and television for all of these years. I did a television show called Everwood, played the nurse on that, and that was kind of a funny role. I've been on Criminal Minds. I've done films with great actors. I, I got to work with Elijah Wood and Diane Keaton, Kevin Kline, uh, Betty White, Treat Williams. I've really, I've had a good, I've had a good time. And so my film and television career has been more in the last, you know, probably 15 years I've concentrated more on that than stage, but my love of live theater is is really is really what I love. I love all of it, but that's where um, Which is the hardest to do, the live stage or the film? You know, they both have different challenges. With stage, of course, you know, you've got all the the character to memorize and you've got certain, you know, you can't mess it up. And so there's a lot of pressure to really get all of the all of the uh, beats in any kind of a character exactly right so that you can really present something that is emotionally strong and that the audience resonates with and you get that immediate response from the audience. In film, uh, it's about being able to access an emotion immediately because you have maybe only two lines or maybe it starts with you and you're crying at that moment, you know, when the camera's on you and then it turns around and you have to be able to do the job right there on the spot. You don't get the lights and the, and the build up to it. So they have different challenges. And I, I really do, I really do love them both, but there's nothing like having a live audience and that immediate re response of applause. Or you can, sometimes I did a show at the Smith Center in Las Vegas, Driving Miss Daisy, and I could literally hear the audience gasp or breathe or cry in, in, with me, you know, in this, great big beautiful 2,000 seat four balcony high place you still felt like you were one with all 2,000 of those people and I've had that experience in 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 small theater um, and to a con on a big stage you can tell when the audience is with you and they're feeling what you're feeling whether it's in laughter or it's in or it's in pain or sadness it's it's a beautiful and unique experience do they have, ever have a live audience when they're filming? It depends on if you're doing um, like sitcom work, then there is, there's a live audience most of the time that is there. 
it's not as common as it used to be, but once in a while, I've never had that on a set that I've been on. All of my comedy shows have been, have been without an audience. So. What do they do, pipe the laughter in or something? Yeah, they do if it's, if it's intended to be a sitcom, but a lot of the comedies now are the ones that I've been on. I'm, I'm working on a comedy called I'm Sorry. Um, What's that about? Well, it's a, it's a relationship-driven comedy, so a lot like uh, you take two of the characters from Friends that are married and, and expand on their life and their love life and how life works or doesn't work and their parents, their aging parents, and, and put all those characters together, and it's quite funny. <laughs> We're pretty funny. So working with some great comedians on that um, show. And, you know, there's all sorts of other other little pieces of, of, uh, of Jam Broberg and different things uh, out there. Um, you know, haven't hit the, hit the big uh, recurring series regular role in this, in this stage of my life yet, but um, I do a lot of small one or two day film shoots and things here and there. I interviewed uh, Robert Redford uh -huh. right after he made a movie that was originated, I think, on Broadway. Uh, forgotten the name of it, but uh, he was not Robert Redford at the time quite. Yeah. This was yeah. in Salt Lake. Wow. And another actress I interviewed at the time ridiculed him for living in Provo, Utah, Sundance, mm -hmm. you know, and everything. That he'd never make it big in the movies living in Provo, Utah. <laughs> so. Do you have that feeling here? You'll never make it any bigger than you are at St. George, Utah. <laughs> you know, I, I think that it's a relative, um, you can really make an impact with your, you know, your passions and talents and things anywhere that you are. And you never know if that's going to go big like a Robert Redford or not. You can't really, um, I don't know that you can plan it out. I think you just do it because you love it and you live where you feel you can make a difference. I've moved back here recently because I want to make an impact with this new theater that has just been built. Tell and, us about the theater. Oh, it's just a beautiful, intimate, high-class, upscale um, building that the theater will be, uh, uh, will accommodate theater in the round, thrust, or proscenium style shows, concerts, both music, dance, um, concerts are planned. We have our first musical there called Title of Show is opening at the grand opening on October 20th. A uh, wonderful musical that you don't, you don't see it done too much, uh, but it's hilarious and poignant. And then we have some plays scheduled. We have some scholarly activities like staged readings, um, a lecture series. We've got a storytelling event that's now gaining in popularity, a poetry slam. We want to do improv there, really to kind of bring some aspects of the arts to this whole entire southern Utah region that you don't really see anywhere else, and an educational component in our summer programs for students and kids who are looking for excellence in performance in different areas and aspects. It's really a beautiful building and a beautiful place, so we hope people will come out and support it. Musica is coming from this 10-piece folk music group from Prague is our very first concert, and they're just hilarious and fantastic, and we happen to have them on our, first, our very first concert on the 21st of September. And then Rosin, have you ever heard of Rosin? They're from here, local. They started here, and they're these two cello they're cellists and they play everything from Michael Jackson to classical they're, and they're extraordinary. It's really exciting to see the kind of talent that we have in this region and then bringing in talent. We have a show coming from New York in February called Vietnam Through My Lens which beautiful story of a, of a man who's an actor in New York but was a soldier in the Vietnam War and the photographer on the front lines mm. and he brings his photographs and tells his story and has been acting in New York all of these years and has quite a successful show that we're going to bring in February. So it, it'll be a really eclectic, that's our mission is that we offer diverse artistic endeavors to the community. So there'll be a lot of um, 
diversity in our programming and just exciting things to bring out that niche market that's looking for something unique. Well, there are a lot of people here that want to be entertained. So yes, and there's not that. enough to do at night. That's what the that's what the case for support says. The thing that we have are lots of things to do during the day and not enough to do at night. So this 200 seat intimate theater, we're gonna we're gonna bring a lot of variety and fun. I think I think it's going to be a really really great success. <laughs> I've got some information here about you. It says uh, documentary film focuses on the actress's story. Tell me about that. Well, I was kidnapped as a child. How old were you? I was 12. And it was a family friend who we had met two years earlier and not knowing that for two years he was really planning the perfect crime. This was a married man, five children, we became instant friends as all of their children lined up with all of us and uh, in age and, and um, there was a lot of pre-grooming that took place which happens with a, a lot of children who are targeted and then um, subsequently abused. They, the, the perpetrator knows just how to manipulate the mother to get to the child or the father, you know, to become the best friend, to trust to trust them and um, the whole reason is that they're trying to gain access to the child. So it's a really remarkable story, of, especially because my family survived it and we are still, we still love each other and we're intact and we, we see how that could have gone a very different way. So we're really, we're really lucky to have had the 10 years that we had before this happened where my parents did such a marvelous job building a, a base of trust and a base of love that we were able to survive that four, it was a four year ordeal. Four years? Yeah, I was missing for 39 days the first time and then after being found by the FBI a year and a half later, he kidnapped me a second time mm -hmm. and I was missing for over four months the second time and then the brainwashing, the mind control and manipulation was so severe that I never told anyone what was really going on um, throughout that time. And a lot of people in a much, maybe not as dramatic a story, but they are holding on to secrets. And that's really the message. We want to make sure that nobody is holding on to a lethal secret, that they tell their stories and that they know that there is hope and life after you know, the trauma and that they can help to prevent it from happening to others by sharing their own stories. That's really the purpose of bringing this story to light. And it's very raw, it's very real, it's very honest. My parents and sisters, all of us, and my FBI agent is interviewed. Um, you see, you know, every mistake that we made and that my parents made, they've put it all out there so that somebody else won't make the same mistakes. It's really quite a remarkable um, story when I look back. It brings me to tears every time I I think about what my parents went through, not only what I went through, but what they suffered and what my sisters suffered through that four year period of time. And through all of that, they stayed connected as a family. Yes, I mean, all, all, there was a time when they almost got divorced because he, he, the you know master manipulator that he was, he was trying to woo my mother and getting her over here and causing a big smoke screen so that, you know, it's, it's amazing how keyed in someone with a, a, a plan, a diabolical plan, can find every person's weakness and know how to get them over a barrel, so to speak. And that's what he did with my parents and with me. So there was a time when it almost all ended in divorce and the implosion of my family, but it didn't. And that's the, that's the happy ending to this story. And, that, and that's the possibility for all people, anyone who's been through a really traumatic event can know that it doesn't have to live and, and run their life. That's my message is that there's much more to your life after your traumatic experience and if you can do something good with it, that even helps the healing process more. So that's really what it is because that sexual assault and a, that rape that continued even when I was at home because this man would get out of the mental hospital, would 
get a note to me at school and I'd leave school on my bike and he'd meet me somewhere and it's just it's an incredible story of uh, brainwashing really even more so than probably the sexual assault. The other situation similar to that that I'm familiar with of course is the Elizabeth Smart mm -hmm. thing. Right. And uh, it's a horrible thing that happens and sometimes people wonder well how could that possibly happen but right. once you're in it you can understand that. Right, and that was really the, that, her story coming out at that time was really the catalyst for me wanting to take my story really public in a way because I remember a woman that was interviewed on the news at that time when she was found who just kind of crossed her arms and said, you know, how can this be that, you know, why didn't she run in the street and start screaming and, I mean, she was around people and she saw the posters. And I was so stunned because I knew why she didn't run in the street and start screaming. I knew that even if her mom had been there and she'd have lifted up her veil and said, Mom, it's me, she wouldn't have done that. And I knew why. I understood what that kind of manipulation and control is. is. And I knew I had to share my story. And I was getting ready to speak at an educational conference for educators, school counselors um, for the state of Utah. And it was right then that I, I wrote a, an email to Oprah and to a couple of others and said, I have a story and I want to tell it <laughs> because I know why this, this little girl didn't run in the street and start screaming. And I think it, there's so much misunderstanding and we are very rarely is it a scary stranger, like in her case. Almost always it's someone that the child knows, the child trusts, they love this person. And so the complexity of that kind of control and mind control is really deep because this person is supposed to be someone that you love, that you trust. So it's a, it's a very um, common story. Even though my story is quite a fantastic story, the common thread is that there were 700,000 children who went missing last year in the United States and only 115 out of 700,000 were taken by a stranger. So there's a big misconception that missing children are taken and abduct, abducted by, by strangers. It's not true. And certainly those that are abused, they almost always know their abuser. Almost, it's almost 100% of the time. So What percentage of that do you know are actually family members? You know, I don't know the breakdown of who are actually family members, but the fact that, that you know, most of these cases that are reported, at, at least once that gets to the federal level and the FBI, um, almost every story that you hear is someone in a family or an extended family or a family friend or someone in the congregation or in the, you know, community organization. It's, it's rarely a stranger. It's really hard to wrap your head around it because we don't want it to be that way. We want to pretend that it's not that way. But I would say out of a room full of people that I might talk to, 50% of them have had something happen to them personally or they have someone very close to them that it's happened to. I almost never have a room full of people who do not know because it's themselves or someone close to them who has not been through some sort of sexual assault and most of them before the age of 18. That's the thing, that's the statistics. I mean, there's certainly people on college campuses, this is a huge problem, but it's about 50% of our children. It's hard to believe it, but it's true. <laughs> you know, I must have been naive growing up. This, I don't remember these type of things mm -hmm. being in the society then, but maybe mm -hmm. I was just uh, blindfolded or something. Well, I don't know that you were blindfolded, but certainly, like my parents, they didn't know what a pedophile was. We weren't talking, we didn't have the talk shows that we've had, we didn't have the, the communication in the same way that we do now, so people are talking about these things more. I think that they, they have existed for a long, long time, but there was no voice, there was no awareness, and people now have ways, you know, whether it's social media or it's, um, it's certainly true that back in, you know, in the 70s when my kidnappings happened, 
I mean, you know, our telephones were connected to the wall, <laughs> you know, so it was a very yeah. different time. Now we have a lot of programming and we have a lot of aspects that can get this message out and can get people talking because if people are holding on to a secret, it's probably affecting their life and not in a good way. Well, tell me about your family. You say you have a mm -hmm. son. Tell me about him. Yeah, I do. I have a 28-year-old son who I absolutely adore. He's uh, working in production in Los Angeles. He's worked for the cruise line companies on, you know, backstage. He loves that kind of, he's kind of, you know, I guess, chip off the old block. His father also works in the entertainment industry. Um, so, you know, he's trying to figure out exactly which path he'd like to take because there's a number of interests that he has. Um, he also loves the computer world and, and uh, is working on an online business as well. So, you know, we're, we're very close. He's been a great support to me. I dragged him around a lot to a lot of uh, plays that I was doing or, you know, on the road with me. We've, we've, uh, we've shared a lot and I, I'm really proud of him. He's a really warm, loving human being and he has a big desire to also make a difference inside of this, uh, the cycle of abuse. He wants to ride his uh, bike around the world to end the cycle of abuse and get other cyclists and people involved in doing something like that, raise awareness. So he's working on planning that, that trip. <laughs> well, that sounds fun. Tell me about your parents. My mom and dad, they live here now. They're uh, you know, long time Pocatello, Idaho residents and we moved them out of the cold a few years back and both of them are still doing quite well as far as you know, when you're hitting that 80, year old Mark, you think, oh, they should slow down, but they both are still doing lots of great things in the world as my mother has just finished the second manuscript that we are hoping for a, an international publisher to take our story with this new manuscript that she's finished that includes all of the recent, because this man showed up on the Dixie State Campus when I was giving a, a, a what Recently? was it, a conference about 10 years ago saw my picture on a poster. We didn't know where he was living or if he was in or out of jail or where he was. And he saw my picture and he came to this campus in a van with a gun. And I was speaking for 800 women and their daughters in the ballroom here at the, uh, at the Dixie State University campus, um, telling my story, trying to raise awareness. Um, and it uh, ended up that he, he was found uh, guilty on several charges and he ended his life after that. It was a two-year process before it went to trial, but three felony charges, two misdemeanors, and it was during that time that these other women who he had also raped his children started to show up and found us and said, this same man did this to me as a nine-year-old little girl or as an 11-year-old little girl. And one of the women who actually lives back east contacted the documentary and said, I'm the one who put him in jail 10 years after my second kidnapping. And he had, um, he was convicted for rape of a child in Salt Lake City and uh, spent one year in jail and then he was out. So these were women that happened after me. It's quite a, it's quite a sad, <laughs> sad uh, state of affairs, but that's kind of the way it goes. Well, constitutionally, I think rights have to be protected, but sometimes I think we go overboard protecting yeah. the wrong rights. Yeah, and I think that we have to really take a look at how we are, are we able to, the people that we can help, we should help them and get them back into society. And those that really can't be helped or trusted, they have to not be in society because it is not, safe for our children. So yeah, we really do have some things to look at there because it's kind of mixed up right now, I feel. Got three and a half minutes left. Tell mm -hmm. me about your siblings. Oh, my sister Karen, she's married to a great guy and they have five amazing kids. Like I said, they have three or four now, I think, living here. Uh, they're in uh, Prescott, Arizona. And um, she's very active in promoting family um, through the 
through the work that she does. She's also a school teacher. She's, she's the brains. You know, my my younger sister and I were more of the artistic types. Although I shouldn't say that. My youngest sister, she lives here. She's an attorney, and she and her two children are you know busy, busy family as well. Now my sister is uh, in Arizona as an empty nester, so I keep telling her, why don't you move down here to St. George? <laughs> you know, most of your kids are either going to school or working here, but I don't know if I'll get her here, but she's very active in promoting um, issues that are important for family, um, you know, preserving the family and, and making sure that children are protected as well. And my younger sister, she works here as she's an immigration attorney trying to help uh, unite families as well and so I, I have my between my parents and my sisters and what they who they are in their in their own lives and communities you know they've all tried to really make an impact and a difference in the world and I really am so proud of all of them my stepdaughters same thing they they work on on passion projects and they they teach school and they work with kids and they they, they are all just amazing people. I, I feel like I've been really lucky to have the people in my lives. Even, you know, it's funny, a lot of people don't talk about their ex-husbands, but I do, because they too have made amazing contributions to society and in, in what they've done in their, own, in their own world and in their own way. And I, I really love living in St. George because I think this community really does want to make a difference. So I hope that people will support um, support the new Center for the Arts out in Kayenta. I hope they'll come out and support that because for me, the theater was my, my hospital, my therapy. I definitely did a lot of healing through those characters I played and those emotions that I could portray. And on both sides of the audience, when we can, when we can look at another person's human experience and share that commonly it makes a difference. We find out that we're far more alike than different. And that's what the arts do, and that's what we're trying to do on our, these personal passion projects that we have, my family, and, and certainly through the arts. So I'm really thrilled that you had me here. Thank you so much. Well, Jan, thank you for being on the show. You've had an interesting life, and you're making an effect, I'm sure, on people today. Oh, I hope so. Hope they'll come out and see the documentary. <laughs> they should. <laughs> this is Lane Rano from the campus of Dixie State University on a story to tell. Thank you for being with us.